Thomas Johnson knew injustice. He was a slave in Virginia on a tobacco plantation for over 20 years. He was treated very cruelly and he, he, he dreamed about being free. And one night he, he decided he was going to try to escape. Two things had prevented him from doing that in the past and that was one, he was afraid he'd get caught and things would be twice as bad and he didn't know what he would do if he was free. As he was beginning to make his escape, he, he passed by a little sh slave shack and he heard some noise inside and he went inside and, and Ezekiel, another slave, was leading a group of folks in worship. And Ezekiel looked at Thomas and said, Thomas, Jesus set slaves like us free. And that began a trajectory for Thomas changed his life. Ezekiel said, he may not, Jesus may not remove the chains from your hands and feet. He may not get you off this plantation, but he'll do something even better. He'll take the chains off your heart. And Thomas trusted in Jesus Christ that night. And when the Civil War ended, Thomas received some education, actually went to, to England and trained there, and he went to Africa to preach the gospel because God set him free. And the good news this morning is, you know, the gospel, as I've shared with you, is first of all, it, it's bad news. We're slaves to sin. We can't set ourselves free. Jesus tells us that. And, and then the, the good news is that he wants to set us free. Jesus said in John chapter 8, if you sin, you are a slave to sin. And we all must admit we've all sinned, so none of us can set ourselves free. But Jesus said, the Son can set you free. So we're here this morning on this July the 4th, our Independence Day celebration, to celebrate who we are as Americans, but also to give God thanks that he, he can set us free because without Jesus, we're all slaves. We're slaves to our passions, to our sins. But praise God this morning, Jesus is here to, to set us free, to break the chains from our hearts. Let's read together Romans chapter 8, a little bit longer reading than normal, verses 1 through 17. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. This chapter begins, therefore. Paul has reached a point where he's saying, okay, all that's happened in the past all of our sins are underneath the blood of Jesus. We give him thanks for who he is. Therefore, there is now, there is now, right now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. That's right now for you. No condemnation for those of us who, who belong to Jesus Christ. The New Living Translation says, I like that. It's one thing to hear someone who's in Christ, but to, to hear those who belong to Jesus. He's, he's our new master, the one who sets us free. We belong to him. Verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit that gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Jesus became the sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live or do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Verse 5, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind that's governed by the flesh is death, but the mind that's governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, 
You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. Thanks be to God for His word this morning. Lord, let's pray. Lord, take the written word, and Lord, by Your Spirit's power and grace, let it become the, the living word. May You go down deep inside us this morning. May we be able to listen for the next few minutes and see what the Spirit wants to do in each of our lives. Hide me, Lord, behind the cross. Permit me to preach your wonderful gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Romans has been called one of the greatest, if not the greatest book in the New Testament. And chapter 8 has been called the greatest chapter in Romans. Martin Luther said it's the spirit-saturated chapter. The Spirit of God just saturates Romans 8. It begins with no condemnation, Romans 8 does. It ends with no separation. And in the middle, we're told that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. What a powerful, amazing chapter Romans 8 is. In Romans chapter 7, we read about living the regenerated life without the regenerator. In chapter 8, we see about the righteous life versus the, the life of, as Paul said, oh, wretched person that I am, who's going to deliver me? In chapter 7 of Romans, the personal pronoun I is found 30 times. In chapter 8, the personal pronoun I is only found twice. That says a lot, doesn't it? In chapter 7, the spirit is only mentioned twice. And in chapter 8, the Spirit is mentioned 20 times. It is a Spirit-saturated chapter to help you and me. It, it's one of the greatest passages on practical Christian living that you'll find. So I pray that the Holy Spirit will help us to listen this morning so we can be more like Jesus and be free indeed. Chapter 7 is about conflict. Chapter 8 is about conquest. Chapter 8 is about victorious living. And we see going from chapter 5 where we have peace with God to chapter 6 where we need to realize that the, that the power of sin is broken. Chapter 7, Paul says, I wind up doing things I don't want to do and I don't do the things I want to do. And then in chapter 8, we see that there is power for living for Jesus Christ. I want to mention three things this morning. If you picked up the bulletin on the way in, you'll see the outline. It'll be on the screen also. I want to mention, number one, that we have, if we're living in chapter 8 of Romans and not chapter 7, we have a new law. We'll talk about that in just a moment. We have a new Lord, and we have a new life. So when we've talked about those three things, we'll have our invitation. First of all, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 help us to see that there's a new law. Look at verse 2. 
because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. There we see the law of the Spirit contrasted with the law of sin and death. In the first four verses of Romans 8, we see there's two ways of living. There's, there's two ways of walking because it, it's very clear that there's two natures within. Three weeks ago, we talked about the natural person does not have the Spirit of Christ. And then we talked about among Christians, there are those who are carnal, who are fleshly, and those who are spiritual. Every Christian has the Spirit of God within. So we find there's, there's two laws. Verse 4 says, don't live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Contrasting the law of the flesh and the law of the Spirit. Let me share a parable with you. Back in the days of the Roman Empire, there was a very rich Roman senator who only had one son. And he loved his son with all of his heart and he wrote out his will and he left everything to his son. As the son got older, became an adult, he became hard to deal with, angry. One day in a fit of rage, he left the house and vowed he'd never come back. And the father didn't see him for many years. After a long time, the father decided that he was gonna have to rewrite his will. And he left everything to a trusted slave. And when the senator finally died, the son heard and he came back home. And he was shocked to find out that the will had been changed and the inheritance went to the slave except for one thing. The son could choose one thing out of everything that would be his. So he began to think, what should I choose? I can choose one thing out of my dad's entire inheritance. Should I choose a house to live in? Should I choose a field that I might cultivate? Should I choose part of the business? And then he had a, a spark of inspiration. He looked at the slave and he pointed at him and said, I'll take you. And then he got everything. When he chose the slave, he got the entire inheritance. This morning, brothers and sisters, God's word is very clear. When we choose the son, we get it all. All the inheritance is ours when we're in Christ. We're walking in the spirit, not controlled by the fleshly nature. The next verse that's going to come up on the screen is Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Let's look at that together for just a moment. As we, as we think about the, the law of the spirit contrasting versus the law of sin and death. Galatians 5, 16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Excuse me for just one moment. There's not a trap door there. I wasn't trying to leave. <laughs> but I did have a flower there. I want you to, everybody see the flower? All right. The law of life counteracts the law of gravity. We all understand that, don't we? And th these lovely flowers are, are standing up straight. They're alive. They're planted in real dirt here, real flowers. Because the law of life counteracts the law of gravity. What happens the, the older we get? We have, to, we have to try and square our shoulders a little bit more and stand up a little bit straighter because what's happening? The law of gravity. It works. The law of life if I were a mind to this morning, I'd ask everybody to stand up and let's stretch. Let's let the law of life kind of kick in a little bit because the law of gravity will pull us over. Now you can see here, these flowers are alive. The law of life is working. But if I cut one of them, what happened? Boy, it happened quickly, didn't it? The law of gravity kicked in. It's no longer controlled by the law of life. Now it's controlled by the law of gravity. In a spiritual way this morning, 
I want you to consider. There's the law of our sinful nature, similar to the law of gravity. It's going to pull us downward. And there's the law of the Spirit. The law of the Spirit is going to lift us up. So in, in Romans chapter 8, we, we get out of Romans chapter 7 where, where Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this bondage of sin and death? And then he says, Oh, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now there's a new law operating within me. I'm not controlled by the law of the sin and body of flesh and sin, but I'm controlled by the Spirit of the living God. While I stoop back down to put these flowers down, why don't you ponder that just a moment and give God thanks that there's a new law operating in you if you're in Christ. It's the law of the Spirit. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, 17, and 18, there are three things here I want to mention before we run on. We see there's the, 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 the coexisting of two natures as we've been talking about within the same heart. There's the conflict that that causes. Verse 17 says, the spirit desires one thing, the fleshly nature desires the other thing. They're contrary to each other. It's like a battlefield going on. Have you ever experienced that? We may not understand a whole lot about the two natures, the duality of two natures within every believer, but we have sure experienced it, haven't we? Huh. In verse 18 tells us how we can get the victory, how we can be conquerors, how the conquest can happen. It's a short verse. Just listen to this. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you're led by the Spirit. Are, are you led by the Spirit this morning? And then the power of our Lord Jesus is going to lift us up if we're led by the Spirit and not, not by the law. Let me mention two other things this morning. And then you can get on with the rest of your 4th of July celebrations. I, th I think our neighbors last night celebrated the fireworks on the 3rd before the 4th. <laughs> I, I had to stay up later than I wanted to. <laughs> Which is a good thing. God bless the United States of America. Well, we've talked about a new law. Secondly, in this passage, we see a new Lord. Our Lord controls. If we're living under the influence of the Spirit, then He will control us. We will not be dominated by the law of the flesh, the law of sin and death. And in verses 5 through 13, there, there's three different ways Paul mentions here in this passage that, that our Lord will control us. He will, he will control our thinking, our minds. The mind that's led by the Spirit is not going to be controlled by the mind that's against the Spirit. Listen to what the New Living Translation says there in Romans 8 verse 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. He controls our mind, our thinking. He controls our motives. Verse 8 and 9 says that if we're, if we're living controlled by the fleshly nature, we do not please God. We do not please Him. But on the contrast, if we're living in the Spirit, then we can please Him. So he controls our mind. He controls our motive. We want to please him. We want to serve him. We want to do what's right. We want to hear him one day say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And then he controls the members of our body. Listen to verse 11. Verse 11 in Romans 8, one of, one of the great, most powerful verses. God tells us in this verse, if, if the Spirit, if the Holy Spirit that touched the dead body of Jesus and raised him to life is in you, then he will raise to life your mortal bodies. He will give you the power to stand up straight in a crooked and perverse generation. He controls things. He's the master. He's our Lord. And aren't you glad he's a good master? He loves us. He loves us. Recently, I read a story about a man named Robert Robert was in prison for most of his adult life. He was released when he was 51 years of age. Spent over 25 years in prison. 
for about 10 years. He was released in 2001. In 2010, he was riding in a subway in New York City. And a movie director saw him. Rashad Green, the movie director, was looking for someone who looked the part. A rough character who looked like he could have been in prison. And when he saw Robert on the subway, he said, that's the one I want. And he hired him and he was filming the movie in a penitentiary in Long Island. And one day, Robert was just wore out and exhausted, and he took a nap on a cot in a prison cell, the penitentiary. When he woke up, he was confused, frustrated. He flashed back. He thought about all those years in the prison, and he, he thought for a while that he was back in prison until he began to wake up. And then his tears of despair turned into tears of joy. And he realized that any moment he could just stand up and walk out of that place because he was free. Are you free this morning? When we finish and it's all said and done and we've had the last benediction and you're, you're going home, are you, are you free? Are you going to walk out of here still in bondage to that law of sin and death that's pulling you downward? Let go and let God and stand up straight and live for him in that victory. Over, let him control your mind, your motive. We want to do what God wants us to do. And over our actual members of our body, we're going to give him first place and let him give us power to live. And then the last thing I mentioned there are three. The last one is a new life. Because there's a new law operating within us and because we have a new Lord, we have a new life. Verse 14 through 17. I just want to read verse 14 and then part of verse 16. For those who are led by the Spirit they're children of God. That's the test of being a child of God. Are you led by the Spirit this morning? Paul has gone through the whole argument here. There's, there's the spiritual desires. There's the carnal, fleshly desires. Which way are you leading? Which way are you living? Which way are you walking? Those who are led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. And then down in verse 15 and 16, he talks about he makes us his own children where we're able to say, Abba, Father. I love that phrase, Abba, Father, more than ever. In Aramaic, Abba means Daddy or, or Papa. Papa. We're his children. We can call him Abba, Father, Papa. Susan and I have five grandkids. Two of them are listening to me preach right now. Allie's the oldest. When she could talk, you know what she started calling me, her grandfather? She started calling me Papa. And when one of them say Papa, that gets my attention. Papa. We're, we're his children. He gives us the witness of the spirit within that we're his children. And we can say, Abba, Father, because he's the Lord, because he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And because no longer are we the children, no, no longer are we children of Satan, we're children of God. Somebody say amen. Aren't you thankful for victory in Jesus? We're no longer children of the flesh, we're children of the spirit. We're no longer children of this world, we're children of the word because of Abba, Father, who has reconciled us and adopted us. One of, the, one of the men in my life that was like a mentor to me, he was one of my favorite preachers. My dad was one of them. George Creel was another one. Alton Paris was the third one. In the 70s and 80s in our annual conference, they were the men that were, that were proclaiming the, the full gospel message. And Alton Paris told this story. I heard him share it at Brasher Springs camp meeting close to Gadsden. And, and when I share this, we'll have our ending. Alton Paris said that during World War II. There was a little orphan from Sicily named Paul Poliskowski who came over and started living with an American family. He got sick, had a disease, and they had to quarantine him up in the attic. Bed. We all know about quarantines now, don't we? After going through COVID. So he was quarantined. Paul was quarantined up in an attic bedroom. One night, he became afraid. It was dark up in the attic, and he he came downstairs and he 
he snuck in the bed with Sammy, Sammy Adams. And a little later, Sammy got sick and wound up dying. Sometime after the funeral, Mr. Adams and, and Paul, they were out working in the field. A neighbor came driving by and saw Paul, the little boy who caused Sammy, his son, to die. And that neighbor stopped the vehicle and he got out and he said, I, I want to tell you, Paul, 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 I want to tell you, Paul, Paul. And Mr. Adams said, wait, from now on, you're not going to have any trouble pronouncing his name. His name is now Paul Adams. Mr. Adams said, now you're mine. And in a similar kind of way on a spiritual level, aren't you thankful God has adopted us? We're the ones that put Jesus on the cross. It was our sins as our shortcomings, our failures. But God the Father, he said, I'm going I'm to forgive your sins and I'm going to adopt you. You're my child. We give him thanks this morning, don't we? Do you, know today, do you know today that you have a new Lord and there's a new law that's pulling you in the right direction, leading you in righteousness? Do you have new life? Do you have assurance? I've asked Ellen to play a couple of verses of Just As I Am. Before we sing our final song, as we continue the theme of God blessing the United States of America, I want to open up the altars for just a moment. If anybody wants to come and do a little business with God this morning, say, Lord, uh, I want to get out of chapter 7 of Romans. I've been wretched, wretched and miserable too long. I want to go into chapter 8. God, give me grace. Let's bow our heads. You don't have to come to the altar and pray. You can pray right where you're sitting. Ellen, would you play a couple of verses as we pray together? As the Spirit's speaking to you right now, just do whatever He asks you to do. We can all do a couple of things. We can pray, we can obey. Lord, we're calling out to you. We want you to help us. Lord, give us life. Let us not be controlled any longer by the things of this world. Lord, help us to realize that we can be very self-determined, but we can't save ourselves. We can't deliver ourselves. Lord, we're bound by sin. We need the Son to set us free. Lord, do your work right now in our hearts and lives. We will praise you forever. Just admit that you need help. And then ask Jesus to be your Lord. And then follow him. we know how humbly, contritely we bow before you. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. In Christ's name we pray.